Hello everyone, it is Monday, March 14th again, um, and my day took a little bit of a strange turn. So this morning, posting the link in the description below, I was watching a Mad Frad interview, Matt Frad interview, sorry, um, from Pints with Aquinas, that podcast, great podcast, subscribe to it, he has awesome content. Um, Pints with Aquinas, he was, Matt Frad was interviewing a Ukrainian um, priest, of the Catholic Church. Interesting fact of the day, Ukrainian, apparently some branches, including the Catholic Church in Ukraine, allow their priests to be married. So he's actually married to a Ukrainian woman and has Ukrainian children and has worked in Ukraine and is working in Ukraine ongoingly helping these refugees. You need to watch this interview. It dovetails nicely with my video this morning that I posted about psychological warfare and what is really going on in Ukraine. And so that's the Holy Spirit working right there. So as soon as I post that video, um, 9.45 Matt Frad's video comes on and it's basically saying the exact same thing only in much more depth and by somebody who is much more knowledgeable than me and who has hands-on experience on the ground in Ukraine and understands the area intimately. So we have to be careful, like I said, about trying to approach this from a secular way. Um, we have to be careful about falling into the trap that Satan has now set from for conservatives, which is this whole, because I'm aligned with Putin politically, that means he's a good guy. And that means he's doing the right thing. And, and no. Like I said this morning, it is basically, how would you like your church subverted? Would you like your church subverted with the woke agenda? Or would you like your church subverted with the fake orthodox religion? That's what it is. The state-run regime of Putin. The state-run regime that is the Orthodox Church. That's not what this video is about, but it's important. So I want to reiterate it. What he said in that interview, though, was extraordinary to me because it had confirmed this hunch I had from the very beginning. If you go back and watch my show from February 20-something, 23rd or whatever, I talk about this weird thing that happened with Putin invading Ukraine uh, aligns with the return of Pluto. Now, initially, I think I had posted that before they actually invaded. And so I was looking at it from a Western perspective of why are these globalists, you know, seemingly instigating or perpetuating a, a, a war, you know, making it seem like there's a war, although now we know there really was a war. Putin really did invade on the return of Pluto, the high holy day of the occult. This, for this for this year, for this season. This is their day. This is when an, ancient occult, um, d fake, false god worship, worshiping emperors and whatever would align their war campaigns with Pluto and with all these other fake gods. That's because they believe they would be empowered by these practices, by these rituals, by these... Um, really what it is, sacrifice, blood sacrifice that these deities crave, that these Satan, these satanic entities require, blood sacrifice, whether it's in the form of abortion or war, it doesn't matter to them. They just uh, rejoice in, in human destruction. Why? Because humans are made in the image of God. So, whew, the man said something that sparked something in me. And what he said in that interview, now I'm paraphrasing, is that the shamans, there's actual shamans in Russia that have more religious rights than the Roman Catholic Church. I'm going to tie this all together for you, but that the Orthodox Church is steeped in, I think he said, I forget whatever, I think, Sophie, Sophieism, I'm not sure if I'm saying, Sophieist practices, I'm not saying, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but basically these, this idea of Mother Earth, pagan gods, pa the, the Earth has supernatural powers that can be tapped into or, or whatever. Okay, pagan ideas is, has been incorporated into the Russian Orthodox Church. 
And so now I'm like, wow, wait a minute. Like I came up with this. I mean, I didn't come up with it. I noticed this prior to, you know, all the nonsense that is going on with the right versus the left and whatever. They want to put you in camps. And so I've even said it on a couple videos. Like, I, I, yes, I want to believe Putin is a Christian. I want to believe that he's fighting for Christian values, but I can't get over the fact that he invaded on the return of Pluto. I just, it wouldn't sit right with me. I couldn't get over it, but I didn't really take it a step further. I didn't really research it. I don't really have a whole lot of time to do a whole lot of research, although it is my slow season from my actual investigative work that I get paid for. So I do have a little more time recently, which is kind of nice to be able to look into this stuff. And what I have found has been fascinating fascinating so the first thing I want to read is this um Alyssa Ordeba on medium.com hosted on Je June 9th 2018 and she says the occult prong of the Kremlin's propaganda machine this is the name of this and she goes in about the story about a 14 year old girl that gets murdered and how they made a show in December of 2017 called The Battle of the Psychics, featuring Al Alina's case, aired on TNT, which is one of the top five most popular channels in Russia, owned by the state-controlled oil and gas giant Gazprom. And it's about how four self-proclaimed psychics were challenged to establish the cause of her death. Okay. A Russian mass cultural staple, The Battle of Psychics, ran its first season in 2007 and continues to broadcast every fall regularly entering the annual top 10 of the most watched TV shows in Russia. Millions of viewers revel in following the purportedly unscripted real life situations. Um, for all its sinister audacity, the battle of psychics is by no means an oddity in the Russian media landscape. On the contrary, it is a standard and a norm of the present day mainstream TV, which has been swarming with occult shows since early 2000s. Similar mainstream programs are abundant. If during the Soviet times anything to do with the paranormal was viewed by the media as uh, atavistic and anti-scientific, today's Russia is embracing the occult with a wholehearted whole abandon. In a poll conducted in 2015 by the state-owned and government-run Russia Public Opinion Research Center, 48% of respondents admitted to believing in sorcery and 55% in human fate being predestined. Estimates show that up to a million of witch doctors, magicians, necromancers, sorcerers, and psychics operate their businesses in Russia. Many of them are quasi-legitimized by licensing bodies which range from dubious private clubs to well-known public organizations such as Vingardov Center, and the Russian Ministry of Health, which issues licenses to practice practitioners of folk medicine. According to other estimates in 2016, the turnover of occult service providers amounted to two billion U.S. dollars. Although the official Soviet rhetoric denied the existence of the supernatural and condemned any such interest as anti-scientific, when the Soviet Union collapsed, overwhelmingly large numbers of ordinary people began to admit their belief in the paranormal. We need to push the pause button right there because I don't think she's going to get into what I'm about to say. Now, let me keep going and then we'll, we'll get into it. Basically, secret agent werewolves digging for oil, occult imagery, and the mass culture of Putin's Russia. After Putin came to power in 2000, his government took a very different view on the subject of the occult from that of the ambivalent confusion of the Yeltsin administration. The occult was now allowed a prominent spot, not only in mass media, including the state-sponsored TV, but also in popular political discourse. The ascent of the Vladislav Zergov, the great cardinal of Kremlin, contributed greatly to the shift. Zer Zerkov, who was 35 by the time he moved to Kremlin, started his career in the early 1990s as Mikhail um, Kor Korchetsky's PR man. Then became the head of the PR at Channel One when he worked closely with the Kremlin advisor Boris Berbozensky. He personally curated what was allowed on what was allowed on Russian television screens. It was seen as the architect of post-truth politics, where facts 
are relative. Um, with the appointment of Zarkov to the post of the deputy head of the presidential administration, the Russian media saw a, sar a sharp upsurge of entertainment shows and TV programs on the subjects of extrasensorial perception, witchcraft, telepathy, fortune telling, astrology, faith healing, UFOs, and contact with the dead. Prominent Russian photojournalists, uh, blah, 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 reported visiting Sir Kov's Kremlin office in 2011 photo blog entry, which, show, which showed framed photos of John Lennon, blah, blah, blah. The mastermind behind the emergence of, of the youth nationalist movement Youth nationalist movements such as Adushi, Vesa, Walking Together, and ours. Zerkov is also a self-confessed music fan known for socializing with Russia's rock and roll Monday. In 2003, he collaborated an album titled Peninsulas with veteran rock star, you know, Let Us Be Like Everyone Else, Avoik, um, Hogan, Appointment, Apocalyptic Imagery. Our master is Lucifer. We know his style. For Christmas, he sends us dust instead of snow. We walk among his endless herd. I will be like you. So basically, this is the guy in charge of what goes on TV. At the appointment of Putin. So there's that. In cinema in 2004, the supernatural thriller Night Guard was produced by the state-owned Channel One and became the highest grossing Russian film released up to that date. Beating the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring. Philosopher Mikhail Reichlin described the main theme of the film as the collapsed Soviet Union versus capitalism, where the former is depicted as positive, vibrant reality, and the latter as something sinister and dark. And this is right out of Freemasonry. And we're going to see that. This isn't coming from me. We're going to see it in a minute. Papers have been written on this. And I just want to stop right now for a minute and take a time out because this is what a lot of people don't understand about Freemasonry either. Freemasonry has many fractions, factions within it. Many of the lodges compete for power. So like the French lodge and the British lodge didn't get along. The French lodge would um, subscribe to more of a uh, democratic enlightenment, you know, the age of reason or whatever, whereas the German lodge would subscribe to a different occult belief. It's all occult beliefs, but it comes out in these different ways within these lodges. It's kind of like how the Roman Catholic Church has different rites. It has the Western rite, which is the one we're familiar with, and then it has like the Byzantine rite, which is a different liturgy, but it's under the same umbrella. Well, it's kind of the same thing with Freemasonry. They have one umbrella of Freemasonry and then in within that it's expressed in different ways. And so this is what we have to understand. Okay, how am I going to do this justice? When Our Lady came to warn us about the eras of Russia spreading, what was she talking about? First of all, she came right before the Bolshevik Revolution, which was what? It was a revolution of Freemasonic ideas, but they were competing Freemasonic ideas. On one hand, it was more of, um, it was more of embracing outright overt occult themes and ideas. And on the other hand, which was the, the fraction that won, it was talking, you know, it was more of this atheistic, uh, science, but it wasn't atheistic. It was more of a, an occult based science and, and rationale, but it, it's a fake science. It's still rife with occult symbolism. And we're going to see that in a minute. Um, it was more of science is God, not entities are God. It was more of, of like the reason the no room for supernatural, no room for superstition. Science is God, you know, the eugenic stuff, stuff like that. Whereas the other face of Freemasonry in the occult is mysticism, false mysticism, because there is a Christian mysticism. We have Christian, uh, Christian mystics such as uh, St. Faustina, such as, you know, name any of them. Um, so it's a different mysticism. It's a mysticism that puts you in touch with evil entities as opposed to heaven. Christian mysticism 
is a gift. It's um, contemplative prayer. It's God come, you know, chooses who he will to give out messages. It's more prophetic. Whereas the other mysticisms are man enacts them by a ritual or whatever. However, you know, cards or a Ouija board or, or whatever to contact specific demonic entities, which they consider to be enlightened beings or whatever that are going to give them power and knowledge. So you see the difference. So Freemasonry has all these fractions within it. So there's like one lodge who will be like, no, we don't really prescribe to this whole, and I'm oversimplifying, but this is what it is. We don't really prescribe to this whole idea. We're more into the science side of things or whatever. And then on the other hand, you have um, like more of the folk, the folk shaman kind of situation. So when Our Lady came, she came right before the Bolshevik Revolution, right? And what did she say? Russia would spread her errors. She should not say the Soviet Union would spread her errors. Now, obviously, that might be because it was still called Russia. And if she said the Soviet Union, maybe nobody would know what she was talking about, right? So she said Russia. So we obviously assume... From looking back, you know, in history, hindsight's 2020, that she was referring to this atheistic science is God, communism, secularism, abolishment of religion. Now, understand, not all religion was abolished. The state-run religion, which is the Orthodox Church, was allowed to survive in a small capacity. Everything else was banned, right? But we have to also understand there were many, many, many spiritual errors of imperialistic Russia. And then what do I mean by that? I mean the czars and things like that who would have seances, occult seances in the public square. Satanism, occultism, that's what I'm talking about. And so some of that did carry over into communism, into the Soviet Union, but it was more um, underground. You know, most of the the practitioners were forced underground because they, they didn't believe, you know, they didn't want to... They didn't want to go that route. They had the science, you know, the science is God, the economy is God, the state is God, and everything else was looked at as competition and not desirable. But obviously what happened? It fell. It didn't work out. It created atrocities. Um, they lost. So now we have this situation where by all appearances, Putin, who was KGB, Maybe he's a re recovered KGB agent. Maybe not. Don't know. By all appearances is trying to give this impression that he's what? Trying to make Russia great again. Not for this, not to give glory to God, to give glory to, to Putin. That's what it's about. And so he has really is taking Russia in a direction of when our blessed mother appeared pre-Bolshevik revolution. And so he's allowing Russians to explore occult practices that are viewed as them getting in touch with their roots, if that makes any sense. It would be like a leader today coming in America, um, a, a president, Saying that, you know, Americans have lost their way. We need to get back to our roots and reverting back to Native American practices. See what I'm saying? And so there's this revival of ancient Russian occult ways that are now mainstream in Russia. And to me, that does not sound like a Christian concept. And so when Putin aligns his war campaign... With Pluto's return, like I red flags and alarm bells started going off in my head. Like this is not, something's not right here. This isn't, the words and the actions are not matching up. And so I think he's this character where he sees the value in a set of principles as far as social conduct is concerned. But... It's not for the love of God. On top of that, the church, the state-run heretical church that has stolen our Eucharist, that they're hiding behind, has incorporated things that the Roman Catholic Church considers heretical. 
not just, not just not accepting the Marian dogmas or the infallibility of the Pope. I'm talking Gnosticism. I'm talking exactly what we're seeing. These occult practices of invading on the return of Pluto. So I'm going to read something to you. Um, there's many. There's many. All you have to do is do a Google search of Russia and the occult and you'll come across all this stuff. Here's another article. Here's. I thought this was fake. Honest to God. I'll be honest with you. I'm like, there's no way this is real. Dailymail.com. It's obvious propaganda. But the more I'm, I'm learning about Russian culture, the more I'm seeing this is probably accurate. This is not. This is probably real. So this says... Coven of Russian witches perform circle of power ritual in Moscow to summon supernatural energy in support of President Vladimir Putin. I want to also say something else. Years ago, before I came back into the church, I was on a spiritual journey. And I had read some um, non-Christian books. Uh, I wouldn't say anything like too that I thought was too harmful, but looking back on it, it was. Um, in one of these, I think it was called... Man, I got to look it up. It, But it was this series based in, um, I think it was a Russian writer. And it was this, the setting was in like the forest of Russia, like maybe, si I think it was Siberia. And it was about this like girl and she lived out in the woods and it was, it was weird. I got to find the name of this, but it was all about this, this energy healing and bending the, the nature to your will. And it was... I thought it was a fic, you know, a work of fiction, but it was almost instruction, you know, instructions on how to. And I, even back then, I was like, yeah, like well, I don't know about this. Like it was intriguing to me, but I didn't. I'm like, I don't, I don't think the trees have energy that you can harness to make into whatever. Like it was. <laughs> so this is part of their culture, and I was, you know, now I'm thinking back on all this stuff. So the coven of Russian witches and seers formed a circle of power on Tuesday to mobilize. I have my St. Benedict medal that was blessed by Father Ripberger while I'm talking about this, by the way. To mobilize their supernatural energy in support of President Vladimir Putin. Dozens of self-proclaimed sorceresses stood, aside, stood side by side to perform the ritual, which they said is one of the coven's most powerful. And now this was in 2019, February 6th. Interesting, right? The date, February 6th, 2019. Um... Dressed entirely in hooded black robes, the group read aloud spells and chanted incantations in an effort to support the 66-year-old Russian leader and help him defeat his enemies. Wow. Um, and this looks like it's in a government building. I'm going to post the link below. But it looks like they're doing it in what I... It looks to me like a government hall, a government building of some sort. Dozens of witches, and this is, the pictures are from uh, Reuters, Reuters, however you say that, R-E-U-T-E-R-S. Dozens of witches dressed head to toe in hooded black robes formed the circle of power. On Tuesdays, the caption, the group met in the Russian capital, Moscow, to harness their supernatural energy to help President Putin. This is un... Where is this from Archbishop Vigano? Sorry. Sorry, but you have to give both sides. All right. Alana Polm, the head of the coven, said the purpose of the gathering was to use the cult to improve Russians' quality of life, which would in turn make the world a better place. This means protecting and guiding Vladimir Putin along the right path. We have gathered here to make the world better off through Russia, she said. We're, this is this is a witch saying this, guys. Like, this is not... <laughs> The coven leader led the spell casting during the ceremony in Moscow yesterday. I don't want to say these words. Breathe Mother Earth, embracing Russia on all sides, she recited. O oh, primordial power, return to the abyss those who wish to hate upon Russia. <laughs> these people are just, they kill me. Whew. May Russia rise and step away from grief and poverty and may the coming days open the gates of happiness for Russia. All hail. They got some weird black and red robes. Um, I mean, this is unbelievable. 
The caption even says, Russian history and culture is full of examples of people believed to derive power from mystical sources. And so this is what I'm saying. Like, this is a lot of this, this Freemasonry. A lot of the branches of, okay, how do I say this? The actors, a lot of the actors in the Bolshevik Revolution were not in agreement when it came to which spiritual direction to take Russia, including in the KGB. There are people in the KGB who thought that, Masons in the KGB who thought that there should have been more of a mystical, oh, overt pagan influence within the spiritual dynamics of communism. Whereas the other side of it, they wanted to stick to science and the state, our God, the economy is all that matters. But they are both from the same rotten tree. Just different branches of the same rotten, filthy, anti-God, anti-Christ tree. Now we shall switch. We shall switch to a paper published. I can't read this whole thing. I'm posting it. It's very long. The Occult in Modern Russia and Soviet Culture um, on 624-93 by Bernice Ro Rosenthal from the National Council for Soviet and East European Research in Washington, D.C. And it's posted on ucis.pit.edu. And this lady, man, I would like to find her and shake her hand. It's very long. I mean, not very long, but too long to read. So I just want to read some highlights. I want to read about the occult in late Imperial Russia. Now, late Imperial Russia, this would be right when our Blessed Mother showed up, was when Russia was going to switch from Imperial Russia to Bolshevik Revolution to commun atheistic communism. But understand, they're both parts, they're both bad. Occultism in Russia, so what I see happening is Putin, make Russia great again, is going back to their occult roots to do so. That's what I, exactly what I see happening. Hiding behind this mask of the Russian Orthodox Church, which has incorporated all, these, all this nonsense, a lot of this nonsense, into their church. It's not pure religion, it's not pure Christianity, and they have stolen our Eucharist to do it. So understand, this is where we find ourselves. Occultism in Russia was part of a larger cultural tradition that was philosophically reinforced from within. Russian Orthodoxy did not discourage personal religious experience. It tolerated Gnostic speculations by clerical and lay theologians that would have been condemned as heresy in the Roman Catholic Church. Let me read that again. Russian Orthodoxy did not discourage personal religious experience, it tolerated Gnostic speculations by clerical and lay theologians that would have been condemned in, as heresy in the Roman Catholic Church. Gnostic elements became embedded in Eastern Orthodox theology in the 6th century and were reinforced in the 16th century by the thought of the German mystic Jacob Bohem, then, in, then popular in the Orthodox seminaries. Bohemi's thoughts, or whatever his name is, very likely in combination with mystical Freemasonry. That's what I'm saying. So you have a, like the science branch of Freemasonry, and you have the mystical side of Freemasonry, and they all fight with each other for power. They don't like each other. The lodges don't like each other. The European, you know, the Italian lodges make fun of the, the Brit British lodges. Very likely in combination with mystical Freemasonry, influenced the reformer Count Mikhail Spernowski, whose father was a Mason. Vladimir Odesky, author of Russian Knights, and Alexander Golitsyn, in, I don't know how to say this, Koshevib, both close associates of Tsar Alexander I. Bohem also influenced Russia's greatest philosopher, Vladimir Solovev, sometimes called the last Gnostic. And through Solovev, the art and thought, including religious philosophy, of the early 20th century. On the popular level, the dual faith combined pagan pantheism with Christianity. Pagan rituals designed to assure a good harvest, prevent harm, restore health, or harm an enemy survived well into the 20th century. The basic distinction of the dual faith, they call it, it's a Russian name, D V O E V. E-R-I-E, -E, was not between good and evil, but between clean and unclean. 
In medieval and early modern Russia, people of all classes turned to witches and sorcerers to prevent spoiling, ward off the evil eye, and cast spells on enemies and rivals. Witches and sorcerers, incidentally, were often male. As late as the 16th century, the oath of loyalty to the Tsar included the renunciation of sorcery. The peasants' universe was populated by all sorts of nature spirits, mermaids, wood spirits, creatures who inhabited house and barn. Um, peasant nannies re regaled their charges, the children of the more privileged with folk beliefs and legends. The writings of Pushkin, Turgenev, blah, 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 and surprisingly Chekhov contain many examples of occult or supernatural images and themes, especially of the unclean force. The Fruits of Enlightenment ridiculed such beliefs. In his novels, he depicted seances and alluded to Freemasonry and numerology. These beliefs were not part of a coherent system, but their emphasis on invisible forces and other worlds created a mindset receptive to the sophisticated occult doctrines described below. As Western occult systems were introduced into Russia, their structures and forms were adapted to indigenous predispositions, needs, and movements, including political protests. Masonry was introduced into Russia in the 18th century. Such Russian Masons as Ni uh, Nikolai Novikov stressed a personal morality that went beyond external adherence to religious law. In Russia, where civil liberties were unknown, the secrecy of the Masonic lodges facilitated discussion of controversial issues. That very secrecy led Catherine the Great to regard the lodges as covers for political sedition. Frightened by the French Revolution and by rumors that her son and heir Paul were associated with the Masons, she suppressed the lodges and arrested Novikov. Masonry revived in the reign of Alexander I. Some scholars claim that Alexander himself was a member of the Lodge Astrea, where he and persons close to him discussed projects for reforming Russia, including the abolition of serfdom. But Alexander, too, became frightened and turned against the Masons in 1812. The extent to which members of the lodges took the occult teaching seriously differed greatly. That's my point. For some, occult language and rituals were a means of organization and contact. For others, much more. D.S. Mersikovsky, himself a Mason, insisted that the Decembrist idealism derived from mystical Freemasonry, not from Enlightenment rationalism. And that's the difference. There's the mystical side, and then there's what they're referring to as the Enlightenment rationalism, which says, which is like the Thomas Jefferson Bible of no miracle sort of thing. It's this idea that uh, it's very naturalistic, um, but it's not. They try to give it that impression, but underneath, you will see the occult themes coming through, just not in this mystical way. For most of the 19th century, interest in the occult by the Russian elite was confined to a few circles, but in the 1880s, the cultural climate began to change. The fading appeal of the official Orthodox Church, the spiritual, spiritually unsatisfying atheism and positivism of intelligentsia, the destabilizing impacts of the rapid industrialization of the 1890s, political upheaval, cultural disintegration, and the association of rationalism and materialism with the West, combines to create a climate of personal confusion and religious quest, which was receptive to the occult. New occult systems attracted many serious and dedicated adherents. Um, and then it goes on. As the spiritual culture crisis intensified, some Russians who wished to deepen, supplement, or reinterpret Russian orthodoxy, be Russian orthodoxy, talking about the church, became interested in the mis mystery religions of pagan antiquity, Yoga, Buddhism, and the Jewish Kabbalah. Vladimir Solovev was particularly interested in the latter, meaning Jewish Kabbalah. Mainly through him, the... I'm not even saying that right, but I don't care because it's fake. The Kabbalah, I'll bet, in poorly understood or even distorted form became part of the general legacy of the Russian occult. Russian writers and artists who visited Paris learned about French occultism, French symbolism, and Nietzsche and introduce, introduce them into Russia. They talk about the God Seekers, um, which is a weird thing. Then we have Theosophy was partially, or is particularly attractive to artists and intellectuals seeking a new unifying principle. 
a way to reconcile religion, art, and philosophy. It provided a structured worldview, which could also accommodate other forms of mysticism. While its claim to be a world religion meant that there was no need to renounce Christianity, the symbolist poet Andre Belli, the philosopher Nikolai Berdeyev, and priest Pavel Florensky were all interested. At one time or another, in theosophy, parts partly as a means to supplement or revitalize Russian Orthodoxy. Variations of theosophy developed. A popular theophist lecturer and writer developed his own variant of theosophy, which included Islamic mysticism, uh, Sufism. And it, that can also be seen with the Shriners. Yeah, the guys with the funny hats. Their lodges are heavily based on this, Islamic mysticism. Okay. Until recently, their primary impact was in the West, but their formative years were in Russia. And there was a tremendous interest in them there today. Interest in the... This gave me the creeps because wait until you hear about what Marie Jehenny has to say about the religion in, of, the, of the fifth epoch. Interest in the occult cut across political divisions. Okay. Gortsky and... Let's talk about them. There's occult plays. Jesus apparently was a communist, in case you didn't know, according to them. All right, so let's talk about the Marxist stuff here. Gorky and Lunacharsky formulated God Building, a Marxist surrogate religion to which Lenin vehemently objected. So here you see the infighting. During the revolution of 1905, for they recognized the power of religion and... All right, sorry. Gorky and Lunacharsky formulated God Building, a Marxist surrogate religion during the revolution of 1904, for they recognized the power of religion and myth to inspire people to sacrifice and even die for their beliefs. This is what's being reinvented and resurrected. It's another form of Marxism. It's just not the atheistic form. That's what we have to understand. The Gorky and Lunacharsky and Lenin obviously won. He took over and he wanted the reason, you know, the age of the reason version of communism. God building preached a collective immorality, which dissolved the individuum in the cosmos, a positive version of the Gnostic contempt for the material world. Um, I'm going to tell you something in a minute. Energetism simulated God builders hopes of tapping the latent energy of the masses. In Gorsky's novel Confession, an assembled crowd uses its collective energy and heals a paralyzed girl. On the popular level, there was a surge interest in the occult. Peasants moving to the cities took their superstitions with them. Confused in the new situation, they resorted to fortune tellers, magic, and faith healers. The revolution of 1905 resulted in the partial introduction of civil liberties to Russia, including relaxation of the censorship and legalization of organizations such as Theosophists. Private quests became public. In some circles of the revolution of 1905 was interpreted as the beginning of the apocalypse and would usher in the kingdom of God. Um, people of all classes turn to the occult for direction and guidance. We already read that. Um... Okay, sorry, I had to pause it. There's something I wanted to get to. Um, so the occult, again, blending with other ideas, especially Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, was a factor in intellectual intellectuals' rejection of traditional norms of morality and behavior, especially as relates to sex and the family. So ironically, the Eastern uh, Russian, or the Russian Orthodox Church, one of the reasons... Um, they don't like Roman Catholics receiving the Eucharist in their masses, which they don't want us receiving our own Eucharist. Okay, whatever. Um, is because they abstain from, or supposed to abstain, not only from food and drink, but from sex as well. And so I believe their priests are allowed to get married. I don't believe, I think they have these people called white, white clergy and black clergy and the white clergy are allowed to marry. However, as part of the condition, um, they have to abstain from sex prior to, I guess, consecrating the host. And the laity also are supposed to. Um, and so we don't, pra we don't practice that in Roman Catholicism. So that's why they're iffy about giving us the Eucharist. So they, I guess they invite us to attend the Mass, but not receive the Eucharist. So 
this I found interesting. This phone. Okay. Sorry. Um, where was I? So, yeah, they don't want us receiving the Eucharist because they have this weird thing with sex going on. So, this reminds me of that. The occult, again, blending with other ideas, especially Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, was a factor in intellectuals' rejection of traditional norms of morality and behavior, especially as it relates to sex and the family. Um, Gurdjieff believed that evil was an illusion manifest to those mired in the chains of this world. As in Western Europe, the ideal of androgyny was used to ju justify bisexuality, homosexuality, and lesbianism, but with a twist unique to Russia, arrangements included menages a choice based on the mystical significance of the number three. Fedorov preached sexual abstinence. He thought that people should devote their energies to resurrecting the dead fathers rather than continuing the endless chain of procreation. That's interesting. Um, Berdiev spe specifically opposed the family as tying men and women to this worldly concerns, preaching sublimination without actually using the term. He also believed that wasting the male seed weakens the individual and blunts creative powers a tenant found in many occult doctrines. Um, Aleister Crowley, sex magic, yeah. So the occult combines with an apocalyptic Christianity and radical political ideas, anarchism as well as Marxism, helped to foster a kind of mystical revolutionism. During the revolution of 1905, the symbolist writer Ionov and the anarchist George Chulkov, future of future author of The Veil of Isis, preach mystical anarchism by which they meant revolt against any and all constraints. Okay. Um, a similar cl cluster of ideas led a group of writers called the Scythians to accept the Bolshevik revolution, even though they opposed Marxist materialism. The lie regarded the Bolshevik revolution as the negative apocalypse and expected a positive apocalypse, a third spiritual or cultural revolution to follow and complete the political and social revolution. The influence of an anthroposophy and other occult doctrines is clear in the writings of Belay and in those of Ivanok Rezmink, the organizer of the Scythians. Haters of rational Bergio civilization, they regarded capitalism as the embodiment of the forces of evil. Occult beliefs and practices played a prominent role at the imperial courts. This is what I believe we have. Russia has re almost, in a way, reverted back to. The influence on the royal couple of the faith healer uh, Rasputin is well known. Robert Warth has shown that Rasputin was preceded by a long chain of charlatans and mystics, including a baron Felipe from France. In 1902, before Rasputin's arrival at court, Baron de Rothschild told Sir J. Witt that Russian envoy to France, the then Russian envoy to France, that great events, especially of an internal nature, were everywhere preceded by a bizarre mysticism at the court of the ruler. He may have had in mind the popularity of mesmerism and of charlatans such as Cagliostro in pre-revolutionary France. In any case... Rasputin was the symbol of a malice that would soon lead to revolution. Occult beliefs permeated the growing anti-Semitism of the period. They contributed to dissemination, um, forgery, the protocols of the elders of Zion. Rabble-rousers blamed the ills of the era on demons whom they equated with Jews. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, Rostinov misused the Kabbalah to prove that ritual murder was inherent in Judaism. Um, Emigrant writers perpetuated the idea of the Bolshevik Revolution as a Judeo-Masonic conspiracy. Their works entered into Nazism and are circulating in Russia today. So, now we go on to occultism in the early Soviet period. The Bolshevik Revolution did not end occultism. Very important to understand. Occult beliefs and doctrines mingled with other ideas taken from um, apocalyptic Christianity, Nietzsche, Wagner, anarchism, and Marxism fostered the utopianism of the period. The Free Philosophical Academy, Philosophic Academy in Petrograd and the Moscow Spiritual Academy provided forums for the discussion of 
theosophy, anthroposophy, and other occult ideas. Some theosophists and anthro, anthro, anthroposophists, and this is what Sophism, this theosophist is what this father was referring to, this priest, found employment in Soviet cultural institutions, including TEO, the Theatrical Division of the Commissariat of the Enlightenment, ISEO, the Fine Arts Division, and Prolet, so the Extra Party Organization, founded by Bogdanov and his supporters to liberate the proletariat spiritually and culturally from the past the occult tenet that the individual is a microcosm of the macrocosm in traditional orthodox injunctions against self-will led Eisenhoff, Bol Bolkakov, and Florensky to as um atheize rather than oppose the Bolshevik suppression of the individual right so that was the whole atheistic aspect of things. In 1922, as part of the anti-religious campaign initiated that year, theo, um, theosophy, theosophy, I don't know if I'm saying that, anthroposophy were suppressed along with other forms of idealism, ideas not based on a materialist worldview. Uh, religious philosophers were exiled. Occult circles went underground. There are clear suggestions of anthro and also of Fedorov and Florinsky in the theories of the Soviet psychologist Aaron Zalkind, who believed that a new man with new organs and new sensibilities was being formed. What does that sound like? The new regime itself utilized occult motifs in its propaganda. Posters cried, purge the unclean. A clear allusion to traditional beliefs. The very word purge, chitska, implies a ritual cleansing of unclean forces. References to the many-headed hydra of reaction connote old folk monsters. Lenin decried vampires and bloodsuckers. And so what does this sound like? It sounds like Putin got talking about denazifying, cleaning out Ukraine, right? Cleaning it out from the New World Order and the Western ideology and denazifying it. Doesn't, isn't that what it sounds like? Well, this is very indicative of this time period. Leon Trotsky was certain that Zenita Gpius, the enemy of Bolshevism, was a witch, but admitted ignorance as to the length of her tale. Uh, the Russian text of the document, which formed the Communist International uh, Comintern, prohibited former Masons from joining the Communist Party probably because of the threat posed by their secrecy. Leading members of the provisional government, including Kerensky, had been Masons. In the villages, and I'm sure it was um, their specific, the, the, real, the Masons that perpetuated mysticism were the ones that were banned. In the villages, peasants continued to resort to faith healing and magic rather than consult doctors. Indeed, much of our knowledge of the occultism in the 1920s stems from Soviet ethnographic expeditions and from the reports of political activists, especially members of the Young Communist League, explaining about the prevalence of superstition. Or, sorry, complaining about the prevalence of superstition. To the latter, of course, Christianity itself was a superstition. Yet even the Bolsheviks were not immune, especially those who grew up in the countryside. And that's a very Mason concept, that Christianity itself is a superstition. But they embrace other superstitions. It's just they don't like that one. During the Civil War, for example, according to a Soviet source, a commissar confiscated Green from a reputed witch when she was not home. After finding out who did it, she confronted and then cursed him. Although a young man, he withered and died within a year. Occult motifs permeated Soviet culture of the 1920s and became embedded in later Soviet culture. The decision to embalm Lenin. Check this out. I didn't even know Lenin was embalmed, but he was. The decision to embalm Lenin reflects the abiding influence of occult doctrines which trace their origins back to Egypt and of Fedor Fedorov's belief in resurrection through science. And so that's the difference. Not resurrection through demons, resurrection through science. Whereas resurrection through demons would be more of the mystical um, 
side of Freemasonry. Lenin Crossan, a, f a formulator of the Lenin cult, was an open admirer of Fedorov. The Lenin Masulum was shaped like a cube, symbol of eternity, to Malevich, who designed it. And then they talk about occult novels called Death of the Planet. Um, all sides of artistic and literary words of 1920s acknowledge the incantational and theologic properties of word. Right. Um, numerologic codes appear in the writings of Soviet writers. A major source of early Soviet ideology had been neglected until recently is the philosophy of Nikolai Fedorov. Tol uh, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and Gorky had esteemed him and his ideas before the revolution, as did certain symbolists and futurists, but his greatest influence, interesting, check this out, his greatest influence was after 1917. Interesting date. Fedorov, and obviously that's the cutoff, right? That's the transition, the Bolshevik transition. Fedorov spoke in the language of science, but the major sources of his vision can be traced to the occult. And that's what we have going on right now in the West. They, they speak of science, but they're, the source is the occult. It's not real science. Arguing for a kind of right to immortality, Fedorov maintains that the common task of humanity was to resurrect its dead fathers from particles scattered in the cosmic dust, a kind of transmutation in which science replaces the alchemist philosopher's stone. Fedorov also advocated colonizing space in order to make room for the enlarged population, solar energy, controlling the climate, and transforming nature by means such as irrigating Arabia with icebergs hauled from the Arctic. Interesting. According to V. V. Ivanov, Fedorov set the agenda for Soviet science. Um, the leading Soviet student of Fedorov interprets him as a theorist of love and cooperation. Bolsheviks and Stalinists, however, discerned and perpetuated the authoritarian and totalitarian implications of his philosophy. Trotsky's labor army stems from Fedorov's idea of a common task. The illegitimate son of Prince Garrigan, Fedorov, lived on the family estate, but probably through his mother, identified with the Russia of poverty and hardship and with the unlearned to the learned. He never married, and as far as we know, never had a sexual relationship of any kind. Throughout his work, the sex drive is treated as a negative, natural force that must be regulated by man. He is the most patriarchal of Russian thinkers, unity, order, control, regulation, restoration, Autocracy, strict devotion to the narrow task, return of the past, these are his passwords. Fedorov's visions interpreted, interpreted as the conquest of nature, appealed to worshippers of technology inside and outside the Communist Party. In the utopian atmosphere of the 1920s, the boundary between magic and science disappeared, and that has not returned. Technology became the force that will rescue Russians from poverty and backwardness, build socialism, create a beautiful, happy, and prosperous new world. And we're seeing that, right, with the Great Reset. After, um, so let's go to the Stalinist assimilation of the occult. I want to go skip down to today, the current scene. De-Stalinization and the collapse of communism created favorable conditions for the occult revival that is so prominent. A, a component of the current scene. So we have this Stalinist, Leninist, um, science will, the transhumanist agenda. And what we're seeing that in the New World Order right now. But prior to that, Imperial Russia was also steeped in the occult. So I have to wonder when our Blessed Mother showed up right at 1917 as Imperial Russia was steeped in the occult and right before the Bolsheviks came with their occult science theories, which Russia's of uh, which errors of Russia she was referring to because there seemed to be quite a lot. And it seems to me that the that Putin in the current regime is trying to resurrect Russian heritage to a pre-Soviet Union time to, to what looks more like Imperial Russia and in so doing that are embracing all the things that made Imperial Russia including occultism. <laughs> yeah. 
can't make it up. You stuff you're not going to hear about on Netflix, kids. So de-Stalinization and the collapse of communism created favorable conditions for the occult revival that is so prominent a component of the current scene. And this was in the 90s. Old beliefs have been rediscovered. That's my point. Old beliefs have been rediscovered. Underground groups that somehow survived the Stalin years have surfaced and new streams are proliferating. All the while, the Roman Catholic cardinals are being deported if they try, in the words of that Ukrainian priest, to even build a kindergarten or daycare in the front of a Catholic church. So this is no Christian nation. We have been fooled. This is no Christian nation. So let's just admit, let's call a spade a spade. Post-Stalinist post literature was one of the first venues for the open expression of occultism. In On Socialist Realism, written around 1956 and published in 59, um, the author stated that realism of any kind is inadequate to describe the Soviet present, for that some sort of fantas major majoric art is necessary, a type of art that will teach us to be truthful with the aid of the absurd and the fantastic. Okay, so open interest in the occult surged in the Gor Gorbachev years, 85 to 91, triggered perhaps by his call for new thinking and has grown steadily since the failed coup. And so that's before the official, well, I guess that's actually, when did the Soviet Union officially collapse? Wasn't it 86, 85 or 86? Not sure. So... The film Repentance, 80 to 81, utilizes symbolism, surrealism, and the occult to depict Georgia in Stalin's time. In September 10th, 1989, the New York Times introduced its readers to Duzuna Davichisvi, the faith healer who had tended Brezhnev and Antoli Gash Pervosky, whose primetime TV program, now off the air, included faith healing at a distance. A Soviet scholar told me that Brev Brezhnev's enemies managed to have Davish somebody's Moscow resident residence permanent permit revoked and that bereft of her ministrations, he died. Okay, nobody cares. Um, there are also pragmatic reasons for the interest in psychic healing. The scarcity of medicine and the poor quality of medical care available to ordinary people. In 91, a second edition of Irme Pardnov's The Letter Pardnov's The Throne of Lucifer, Critical Sketches of Magic and Occultism, was published. Theosophists, anthro, anthroposophists, and followers of Gorjev and Uspensky began to emerge from the underground. Esotericism has gained scholarly respectability. The Institute of Philosophy in Moscow hosted a conference on it. On March 17th, 93, papers were presented on alchemy, Chinese mysticism, esoteric aspects of ancient philosophy, es esoteric interpretation of the Holy Trinity, and esoteric elements in Russian sophiology. And this is this Russian sophiology, sophist, is what that Catholic priest was saying is very much in the Russian Orthodox Church. The Academy of Sciences will publish a book on astrology and a book on Russian communism has already appeared. Um, some Russian occultists are developing a new form of Russian messianism, an occult version of the Russian idea. Stainer's appeal to Russians. It will be recalled. It will be recalled. Was that, I'm sorry. Stainer's appeal to Russians, it will be recalled, was that he assigned a special role to Russia in the new era. What does that sound like? Uh, Rorik once stated that the new Russian spirituality will benefit the whole world. That sounds like what that witch was saying. Just reading the words on the screen. I'm not me. This isn't my opinion. That's what she said. Russian astrologers often quote the American astrologer Alice Bailey. Oh man. Who stated that out of Russia will emerge a new magical religion. And this is where we, we're going to have to transition over to Marie Jaheni. Valentin Kolkov maintains that the roots of the New Age movement are undoubtedly in Russia. 
He predicts a third culture that is different from and superior to Marxism and liberalism. And so this is the natural evolution, though, of communism, because we all know communism doesn't work because we are spiritual beings. So when you try to say that there is no God and science is God, it doesn't work because people are naturally drawn to spiritual side of things. So the next the next solution to maintain power is exactly what Putin is doing, controlling the religion so that it gives off a storyline that makes you powerful. And, a, a pair, uh, and obviously the Roman Catholic Church is its own entity, so he can't control it as easily as he wants to, which is why it's not welcome in Russia and which is why he doesn't want it in Ukraine either. Indeed, a politicized, here, exactly, a politicized occultism of the far right has emerged. Reprints of emigre literature of the 20s and 30s, which blamed a Judeo-Masonic conspiracy for which no evidence exists for the Bolshevik revolution and by implication for Russia's current problems are circulating. Many are poorly printed on cheap paper. And that, it's not that the Masonic influence is a conspiracy, but the, the Judeo, like the Jews, that there's no, okay. Um, so it features thinkers such as Joseph Mastre, Nietzsche, and Julius Evola, an assorted occult myths and legends, anti-Jewish contemptuous of liberalism and democracy. Dugan is in contact with his ideological co counterparts in Western Europe, some of whom sit on the editorial board and who may even be providing him with funding. The Russian far right includes former communist, um, apart chicks. For example, the author of the Red Kabbalah identifies himself as a former KGB agent. Klimov claims that Hitler's secret... Sorry, my phone. Sorry, I keep getting rudely interrupted. So, I found this to be interesting too. The Russian far right includes former communist apparat chicks. I don't know what that means. Grigory Kilmoff, for example, the author of Red Kabula, identifies himself as an emigre and a former KGB agent. He claims that Hitler's secret Politburo was actually comprised of Zionists who instigated anti-Semitism as their means of controlling the world. Contemporary Russian occultism is a highly... I'm sorry. He claims that Hitler's secret... Politburo was actually comprised of Zionists who instigated anti-Semitism as their means of controlling the world. It's all just very interesting at how we have these themes coming out of denazifying um, Ukraine. And it's just what world are we living in? These people are psychotic. Contemporary Russian occultism is a highly variegated and diffused phenomenon. If history is any guide, some trends will prove to be ephemeral once stability is restored. Others will lie dormant until the next spiritual crisis, while others, while still others will be incorporated into or themselves become the established truths of a new era. Just as chemistry grew out of alchemy and astronomy grew out of astrology, advances in medicine, psychology, parapsychology, and ecology may well come out of the new occult movements. Magical or shamanistic techniques at work for reasons we do not yet understand, are dismissed or ignored because they do not fit into current or scientific paradigms. In the Soviet Union, um, photographs of the aura is used for medical diagnosis and techniques that derive from the occult were used to train Soviet athletes for the Olympic Games. In the West, attention being paid to the mind-body interaction has resulted in the use of biofeedback and other effective techniques, adult doctrines, fructified 19th and 20th century arts. Um, and then I found this to be interesting because this is obviously, politicians know this. Politically, the occult is dangerous. In pre-revolutionary Russia, so this is imperial Russia, pre-revolutionary Russia, the idea that all are one, that the individual is but a microcosm of the macrocosm, fostered an indifference to legal rights, and guarantees that protect the individual from other people and from the government. So at least on a social law, social justice, if you will, standpoint, 
there are politicians who see the benefit of the doctrines of Christianity. The same tenets could support a view that each individual has a unique irreplaceable role in the cosmic order, but in Russia it did, it did not work out that way. Contempt for material reality induced atheistic escapism and militated against the very rational pragmatic mindset necessary to solve the all-enveloping crisis. Attributing control of the human destinies to occult forces facilitated demonization of Jews in late Imperial Russia and of, and of old Bolsheviks saboteurs and wreckers in Stalin's time. All sorts of conspiracy theories were invented and could not be refuted because empirical reality was merely an illusion. And this is, and this is also spread throughout the world too. That's what I'm saying. So which, Ru which heirs of Russia are we referring to <laughs> when our blessed mother tells us that they're going to spread? Because it seems like the Russias of the heirs of imperial Russia are spreading as well as communist Russia. The occult was one factor in the creation of a will to cult, a search for a new messiah who could rid the world of demons and accomplish miracles. Whether Russians will learn from their own history and whether other people will learn from Russia's experience, only time will tell. And so now I want to transition into this because of this um, religion that they talk about that I pointed out as, you know, this new era of spirituality with this new religion it sounds an awful lot like something that I want to point out right quick. Okay. So she talks about, she talks about a lot, but she talks about a false apostate relig religion resembling Islam, a state religion resembling Islam that will be established by force by authorities. And she says, Catholics who have lost Greece will happily enter into it. It will be a happy, happy religion of a merry heart that will be completely divested of the sacraments of the church. So we know it obviously isn't the Russian Orthodox Church because they have valid sacraments, even though they're heretics and they have heresies within their um, religion that are allowing for weird pagan things to happen. So to escape the threat of death and sufferings caused by persecutions, many will enter into this false religion to save themselves. And she calls it a new diabolical. No, so many bishops will enter and lead souls to hell. The youth will be spoiled. The purification of souls will be terrible. A new diabolical worship service or universal ecumenical style service will be introduced by Satan. The ministers shall wear red cloaks or simply red. They will have little bread and water for the service, but no valid consecration. They will be permitted to say it everywhere, under the open sky and in all houses, i.e. possibly a cryptic reference to all places and churches of worship of all denominations. No wine is mentioned as part of this service. This would fit with the Islamic-like new religion that will be forced upon people as wine is forbidden in Islam. A book of the second celebration will be established by the infamous spirits who wish to crucify Christ anew and who await a new Messiah. I.e. this diabolical new rite of worship will be an endeavor of Antichrist precursors. Not the Antichrist himself, Antichrist precursors. Many holy priests will refuse this book sealed with the words of the abyss. But there are those who will accept and use it. Our Lord, apparently he reiterated the warning of the apostate right. I will give you a warning even today. The disciples who are not of my holy gospel are now in a great work of the mind to form as the second facsimiles when they will make to their idea and under the influence of the enemy of souls a mass that contains words odious in my sight. When the fatal hour arrives, when they will put to the test the faith of my eternal priesthood, it is in these sheets that they will give to celebrate in the last period. The first period, it is that of my priesthood, which exists since or after me. The second is the period of persecution when the enemies of the faith and of the holy religion have formulated. Um, and they are strongly enforced. These sheets as the book of the second celebration, these infamous spirits or, spirits or infamous minds, are those who crucified me and who are waiting for the reign of the new Messiah to make them happy. Many of my holy priests will refuse this book sealed with the words of the abyss. Unfortunately, they will be the exception. It will be used. 
Before the century is long over, they will have already covered our Lord with all sorts of insults, torn apart the Holy Gospel and the religion he established, and turn it into an appalling form. The holy sacrifices of the altar will have taken an appalling form. And that would be um, probably what we have going on right now. They will um, throw all these abominable things, abominable things over his shoulders and all over his body. A, fight, a frightening revelation that transubstantiation is still happening. The evil ones will not stop at this hateful and sacrilegious road. They will go further to compromise all at once and in one go the holy church, the clergy, and the faith. Legitimate pastors and bishops will be replaced by others formed by hell initiated in all vices, all iniquities, who will cover souls with filth, new preachers of new sacraments, new temples, new baptisms, new confraternities. And it just sounds a little bit like um, all these mysticisms and heresies par excellence in a state-run religion, if you can believe that. Okay, among the new bishops, an entire generation will be without faith. They believe in our Lord's power, but not that he uses the earth for the salvation of souls and for the good and protection of souls. Those who spread this weak faith will not be forgiven. The French clergy will be more guilty than others and punished more than others, but the clergy will grow corrupt everywhere. Woe to the priest who does not consider the gravity of his vocation. Bishops will be willing to abhor, abhor the true faith to save their lives. They will enter into a fake church to avoid death, in other words. They will be the cause of scandals. All the works approved by the infallible church will cease to exist as they are today for a time. When this happens, brilliant signs will be manifested on earth. Darkness will be thrust upon the church and in return, God will thrust darkness on the earth. There is a war and fury against the church. Religion will go, grow um, weaker. Soon it will be almost deserted by the whole world. Soon in large parts of France there will be no more sanctuaries. The bishops will flee. Holy souls will weep over the abandoned ruins. Satan will be granted a complete triumph for a short time. I will attack the church. I will throw down the cross. I will divide or cause division among the people, I will deposit in hearts a major weakening of the faith, and there will be a great betrayal. Satan to the Lord, I will become for some time the supreme master of all things. I will have everything under my empire, even your temple, and all of yours entirely. Paris will be devastated, um, etc. Demons will congregate. In the years when the universal service is introduced or about to be introduced, Satan will make many revelations, i.e. send out many false mystics and visionaries. He will be so cunning with his plans this time that it will be difficult to expose his false messages. He will sound very much like authentic mystics. He will attempt to get people to get lost through these false revelations or lose time trying to expose them all. Also... Cause nothing but strife and contention through the false mystics as the faithful attempt to expose them for the fakes that they are. Satanic possessions and obsessions will be many before the crisis hits. Also many satanic apparitions that will bring happy messages. The devil will appear in apparitions. Woe to those who will make pacts with the personages in these diabolical visions. In the months leading up to the great crisis, many souls will be possessed. The world will become insane with fear and the devil will travel around and attempt to make people give up their faith and deny the cross. When the great terror is widespread in the days of God's justice, many priests will give up the faith for the easy life of the apostate faith. To save their lives, they will end up becoming traitors to their priesthood like Judas and lose their souls. Do not be a cowardly Christian. Those who are cowardly and will not stand for the faith will be as guilty as those who want to destroy everything and who will attempt to overthrow Christ's reign. Do not follow the crowd. Many will abhor the faith and trample on the cross to save themselves during the persecutions. Do not follow their example. Do not trample the cross. Your courage will soften the executioners. Despite all the attacks and plots to overthrow the church, it will remain infallible. If it wasn't for the prayers and sacrifices of the faithful and also the mass holding off God's justice, the chastisements would have happened much sooner. 
evil on earth is growing. Divine justice will be forced to send more punishments. The sacrifices and prayers of the faithful lessen the punishments. Heaven calls for sacrifices to appease the divine justice. Um, warning signs will be given. France will suffer punishments. Um, they must, France must suffer a cleansing, purification. Our Lady will appear somewhere with the Holy Infant to warn the people. Okay. Before or just as the first crisis, this is the three crisis periods. There's, I want to read about Russia specifically. So just hold on. Let me hit the pause button here. Okay. So Sorry about that. So, um, Marie Jehenny, she talked a lot about the apostate religion, not Russia. The one I was thinking of was this other, um, what's her name? Elena, blessed, blessed sister Elena Alio from 1895 to 1961. She has a lot of or a lot of um, visions and was told a lot of prophecies as a storm of fire. Um, talks about Russia burning. Our Lady and unholy propaganda has spread countless errors all over the world, even causing persecution, ruin, and death. See how Russia will burn. Before my eyes stands an immense field covered with flames and smoke. Souls have been immersed here as in a sea of fire as in this fire says the virgin will not be the work of men will be will be lit by angels therefore i ask for prayer penance and sacrifice so that i can act as mediator for my son to save souls i want people to know that the punishment is near a fire never seen before will descend on the earth and a large part of humanity will be destroyed so this is along the same lines as akita um, she talks about the three days of darkness the world no longer um, deserves forgiveness. People no longer submit to the church. The wrath of God is near. Pandemics. During this, okay. So the dictators of the earth, real infernal monsters, will destroy the churches with the sacred uh, saboria and will eliminate peoples and nations and things most dear. During this sacrilegious battle, because of the fierce impulse and the relentless resistance of many, everything that has been done by the hand of man will be destroyed. Clouds with gleams of fire will finally appear in the sky, and a storm of fire will fall on the earth. The wicked will be pulverized. September 15th, 1958. Materialism, materialism has spread as an organ organization on the surface of the earth like never before seen if you don't pray my daughter italy will be invaded by russian troops the pope will suffer if men do not return to god a great war from east to west will come a war of terror and death and finally the purifying fire will fall from the sky like snowflakes on all peoples and a large part of humanity will be destroyed the rulers and the people are outside the light of God, in particular those of Italy. The Christian family no longer exists. Rome will be punished. Russia will invade the whole earth and will plant the red flag on the dome of St. Peter. That was March 27th, 1959. 1959, Russia will march on all the nations of Europe, particularly on Italy, and will raise its flag on the dome of St. Peter. Fire will fall from the sky. Russia will invade all the nations of Europe, especially Italy. Italy and will set its flag on the Dome of St. Peter. Italy will be seriously diminished by a great revolution and Rome will be purified in the blood of its many sins, especially those of impurity. The flock is about to be dispersed and the Pope will have, suf have to suffer a lot. And... The commentator is saying, no, a reminder again that Russia was openly communist during the time this prophecy was given. It's possible Russia may return to its old ways if the world does not do what heaven asks and will overrun Europe. Here we also see that the old um, birch sheet prophecies of Germany are true. And so, yeah, I think Russia is going to return to its old 
uh, imperialistic ways. Not so, maybe not so much it's Stalinist ways. Maybe it's um, occult-driven imperialistic ways. Good Friday, 1961. Russia is ruled by Satan. The church will be persecuted. They enter the Vatican to seize the Pope. My daughter, Rome will not be saved because the Italian leaders have abandoned the divine light. Only a small number of people really love the church, but the day is not far when all the wicked will perish under the enormous blows of divine ju um, justice. And again, this was in 1961. Was Our Lady referring to if Russia, if the Soviet... But she's not calling it the Soviet Union. So in 1961, Russia was the Soviet Union. Why wouldn't Our Lady say the Soviet Union? She's calling it Russia. Russia is ruled by Satan. The church will be persecuted. That's happening. That's absolutely happening. When the occults can get more licenses from the government to practice their belief system than Roman Catholics can, I would say that Russia is ruled by Satan, which means the church will be persecuted, which is happening, and they're going to enter to, into the Vatican to seize the Pope. That's why I'm saying it's not that simple. Um, so anyway, this is like an extraordinary long video and I actually redid it. I had a shorter version up originally that was only 33 minutes, but then I kept finding all this information and I really think it's interesting that not, do any prophecies, does anybody know of any prophecies that mention the Soviet Union? And why is that? Why is that? Because they all seem to mention Russia specifically. And so are we talking about Russia as far as imperialistic Russia or are we talking about communist Soviet Union both of which are not good I don't know I would be interested to know and I think maybe only time will tell let me know what you think ending it here Joan of Arc Media out